book which uh, just came out uh, last week and uh, it makes uh, some uh, pretty uh, hair-raising uh, charges against uh, a lot of folks involved with the National Football League. Uh, the title says a lot of it, Interference, How Organized Crime Influences Professional Football. Please uh, welcome its author, Dan Moldea. Dan? <laughs> What are you hearing from the powers that be? Anything? We well, they just want me to go away right now. We've, we've spoken to them, and they don't want to talk about it either. They have nothing to say. But they're not denying anything, and they're not refuting any of the facts. Let me, let me talk about some of the major charges. And I, just, I just jotted down a few of the... I mean, you're saying, you're saying for example, um, uh, virtually every team owner gambles on, on football teams? Well, I'm saying that no fewer than 26... That's uh, NFL team owners have documented ties, past and present NFL team owners have documented business ties to either the gambling community and or the organized crime syndicate. I'm also saying that no fewer than 70 NFL games have been fixed. Now, that, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty uh, rough substance. You're saying no fewer than 7-0 NFL mm -hmm. games have been fixed. You mean the, the, the outcome, the point spread, what? I'm saying the points were shaved and thereby fixed. Yeah. How does this happen? Well, I, I first got into this about 1983. Uh, uh, Vincent Persani, who is the head of the Michigan State Attorney General's Office Organized Crime Division, told me, if you're going to do a book about the NFL, Dan, you're going to have to get into this guy, Don Dawson, because he was fixing games. We knew it. I went to my friends and my sources at the Internal Revenue Service, the Organized Crime Intelligence Division. They said Don Dawson was fixing games. I went to the FBI, the Organized Crime and Racketeering Section of the Justice Department, and Strike Force Field Offices. Everybody told me what Don Dawson was fixing games. At that point, I had enough evidence to pr print that allegedly Don Dawson was fixing NFL games. He was a major bookmaker in the Midwest. I then went to Dawson. I tracked him down. I jumped through all kinds of hoops to interview him. And when I interviewed him on about the seventh or eighth interview, he admitted to me that he had personally participated in the fixing of no fewer than 32 how, NFL how, games. How, and how does that happen? He liked to work with the quarterback. He would, he would, he would go to the, the quarterback would come to him and say, um, I need some bread. Uh, what's the line on the game this week? And the, uh, and the bookmaker would say, you guys are favored by six points. And then the reply was, we're not going to cover the spread. And basically that was it. Mm. Now, do you, you, do you name players? Oh, sure. I name players. And also in 1979, I, name a, I, I go into the specifics of eight fixed games that were uh, allegedly fixed by two referees who were investigated by both the FBI and the IRS. And I, named, I list the uh, eight games in the, on page 308 of the book. Yeah. Uh, are drugs involved in this at all? Yeah, drugs are uh, the real variable in all of this. I mean, when a, when a dealer, a drug dealer has, has a relationship with a player, there's an extortionate edge to that, to that situation whereby that dealer has that player's uh, career in his hands because of the, of the drug policies within the NFL for throwing a person out. Within the, within the past few years, no fewer than nine NFL teams have been investigated because their players were receiving drugs from gamblers. Now, I know gamblers who, on principle, refuse to sell drugs, but I'm not aware of many drug dealers who on principle refuse to gamble. Mm. And uh, the key here is, is, that the, is that the NFL is very aware of the fact, and their worst case scenario is the, the player who's strung out can't pay his bill to his dealer, and so he, you know, he, the dealer comes to him and says, hey, you owe me money, and the, dealer says, and, and, and the player says, I told you I can't pay it, and the dealer says, that's okay, but now you're going to come and work for now, me. Now, the, the obvious question, you know, you're pointing, you're talking about all these games being fixed, you're talking about all these people involved, you're talking about going to various agencies, and they're saying who the people are involved. Why, why has this been... Why has this gone uncovered if this is the case? What I'm also alleging in the book is that no fewer than 50 legitimate investigations of corruption within the NFL have been either suppressed or just flat out killed as a result of a sweetheart relationship between NFL security, which is the internal police force within the league, and a variety of federal and state and local law enforcement agencies. I have more, I'm a big baseball fan, and I have more respect for baseball right now because of the way it's handled the Pete Rose case in the open and honest manner that has handled this case than I've ever had before. I have more confidence in baseball because it's handled... Well, how do these investigations, investigations get quashed? Basically, it's a, it's a, it, the, the NFL security people, who are all former Justice Department people, will go to their colleagues, their old colleagues in the Justice Department or in these various law enforcement agencies, and they'll say, uh, we, um, we can handle this internally. Let us handle it internally so that we're not getting all the publicity that we would be getting. And so to all intents and purposes, these investigations, we became, I can cite chapter and verse, again, I cite about 50 in the book. The, um, it is a strange sport because it is the one sport where you can go to a game and come away, even if your home team is won, disappointed 
because you're not as much interested in the outcome as the players. Oh, yeah, there's a situation I mean, where you have a game where the score is 21-20. There's 30 seconds left on the clock. You have the home team, you're up in the stands, and the home team has the ball on the 30-yard line. Now, the problem is that the home team had to give three points in the game. Now, the quarterback goes down on one knee, and the people in the stands boo. Now, they're, they're, they're starting to legalize gambling in Oregon. They're going to have a, a sports lottery, NFL lottery in Oregon, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, the state isn't in the bookmaking business for Elia Moss and area or philanthropic purposes. Yeah. They're going to be in this to make money. They're going to take a 40 to 60 percent skim of the, of the handle of the total pool of bets. And in the end, they're going to educate the public as to how to gamble, how to use the point spread. And then the public is going to realize that it can get a better, big, bi bigger bang for its buck from Charlie the Bookie, the friendly local bookmaker at the corner bar, who's going to be making put up $11 to win 10 and uh, taking a 10 percent vigorous or commission on the losing bets he books. Now, um, is all this, is what you have written here going to get things unearthed? Well, I'm hoping that there'll be a, uh, I'm hoping there'll be a federal investigation, um, hopefully the Senate Select Committee, to investigate organized crimes influence in all of professional sports, not just football, but on baseball and basketball as well. I'm hoping that there'll be registration and licensing of anyone with a financial interest in a professional sports team, that there'll be public disclosure of financial transactions involving professional sports teams, that there'll be a further examination of public ownership of teams so that the citizens of the cities in which these teams play, the public can have literally a piece of stock in those in those companies. I'm also afraid that the illegal gambling economy has become an adjunct to the First Amendment because of the insistence by the sports media to print and broadcast the betting line and to hire odds makers and handicappers for the yeah. purposes that is, of... That is uh, true. You read the newspaper and the point spread is in there and it's obviously in there to give you information for gambling, is. which is... Yes. Which and is and, and sure. gambling is still illegal in 49 states until September 6th when the lottery is legalized in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, we just have a minute here, but... Um, when you write about organized crime and involvement, does this give you any cause for concern about your own uh, your own safety? And should I be doing this interview? <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes it does. I had a lot of trouble when I was younger, but uh, no one's tried to kill me in almost six years, so I feel well, pretty comfortable right now. Well, I don't. This is my fourth book. This is my fourth book, and I should point out I've never been sued. I've never been sued, and I've uh, and I just I try to treat people with respect, and I think that everybody has something to say. Everyone has an ego, and mob guys are like you know human beings, and you just have to be able to push the right button with them. I've never met a mob guy who's not against wiretapping. I've never met a mob guy who's not. I've never met a mob guy who's not in favor of strong personal privacy laws. I've been bored for hours by mob guys who are whining about the alleged impingements upon their rights and freedoms by the FBI.